PSL season, I feel like, starts earlier every year. Pumpkin spice for everyone. We should embrace the PSL. Stop hating it. Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? I love me some pumpkin, so I am so excited that today we're gonna do a blown out pumpkin pie episode. We're gonna make two pumpkin pies from the 1600s to try to recreate what might have been at the first Thanksgiving. One has fried pumpkin and apples in it, and the other we're gonna puree the pumpkin into a paste, but neither have spices. How do you have pumpkin pie without spices? I don't know, I guess we're gonna find out. Okay. Since the pilgrims brought a lot of their food traditions from Europe with them, we're looking to two mid-1600 recipes to get close to what they ate. One is the first ever pumpkin pie recipe from 1651 France, and the other comes to us from a 1670 English cookbook, and it's the first cookbook ever written by a woman. Even though this English recipe is a little bit older, it's probably closer to what the pilgrims ate because they came from England. Things are gonna get a little spicy around here. Huh? Did I just say that? All right, I think I hit my dad joke quota for the day. A quick backstory on the pumpkin. When arriving at Plymouth Colony, the pilgrims were not huge fans of pumpkin, like a lot of things from the New World. When they had to survive that first brutal winter, the Native Americans provided them with pumpkins and taught them how to cook the pumpkins, which made the settlers finally adopt the North American native food. Pumpkins were very quickly adopted by Europeans and integrated into their food too. It only took 30 years from settling at Plymouth Colony for the first recipe for torte de pumpkin to show up in a French cookbook. So, let's get started by making the crust for each of our pies. So we're gonna make the same crust for both. The recipes don't really tell you about a specific crust, but this is a crust that was very common back then. All right, so we're gonna start by whisking up a couple of eggs. Now, I think the thing that's been interesting, we made a couple of pies for apple pie, and they both had really different crusts than I'm used to. I usually make like the really simple flour, butter, water, sugar, salt kind of situation. And the crust we made then had egg whites in it and it ended up being so crispy and light, I was really surprised. So I'm really interested to see how a crust with a whole egg does. I've never made a crust with a whole egg. And there's also some vinegar in there, which I don't know what that's gonna do. So we'll see. We're gonna add a little bit of vinegar. I do know vinegar prevents browning. I don't know if that's what you want from a crust. Maybe it is, I don't know and some cold water. And this is gonna be our wet to help, to help the crust hold together. Now there are some people who question whether the pilgrims even had pumpkin pie at the first Thanksgiving. They, they say that they might not even have ovens, but it's very likely that the first thing they made was ovens so that they could bake stuff, you know, like bread. Okay, so now our dry. We got our wet, now our dry. Flour, salt, there's no sugar in here and I'm just gonna finger whisk this together, you know? And then we have a bunch of cubed up butter that I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna use my fingers to like rub it in. You could use a pastry cutter or a fork, but I like to just use my fingers and work really quickly. You don't want the butter to melt, so you gotta move fast. If it's very warm or you don't feel confident that you can move quickly, then I'd recommend using like a couple of forks or a couple of butter knives like held together side by side and then you can cut the butter in there. I feel like the crust back then were all like sturdier. Nowadays, we just use butter and just barely enough water to hold it together because you want everything to be like delicate. So the pilgrims definitely owe a lot to the Wampanoag tribe, especially after the first couple brutal winters. The Wampanoag have been growing and harvesting pumpkins for a long time. They probably have a pie too, I bet. You can see the butter is like really broken down. We have some crumbly like coarse cornmeal bits and then we have some little corn flaky bits I'm gonna go ahead and add the wet. So I'm gonna make a little well. Okay, and I'm gonna use a fork to incorporate it all. I'm just gonna pour the wet right in there, bloop. And we're gonna bring it all together with a fork. And then I'm just gonna give it a couple of like kneads to bring the dough together. I noticed that like a lot of these ancient pie crusts, you just bring it together. Because like modern pie crust, you kind of laminate it. You give it a few folds so it ends up with some flakes. But I've been surprised these pie crusts, even without those extra folds, have been really nice and flaky. Now I do sometimes read the comments, and I've noticed that 
You guys leave a lot of good ideas for ancient recipes. If you have any like recipes that have been passed down from generation to generation, let us know. Maybe it'll inspire a future ancient recipe because that's really how food should work. Like it should be a recipe that you learned from your mom who learned it from your grandmother. I'm gonna actually dump this out to really bring it together. And then we're gonna divide this dough in two and it's gonna be the crust for both of our pies. It's feeling pretty good. The egg yolks made the dough really nice and yellow. I became actually such a big fan of the egg white pie crust from the apple pie that the last few pies I made this summer, I put egg whites in it. Hey, that's, a, that's really good for a first slice. You know what they say, the first slice is usually not good. That's why I like to keep the pieces of butter kind of big, because when we do these folds, it's gonna get worked in there a little bit further. This almost feels a little bit like a tart dough with the whole eggs. All right, that feels like it has come together, so. I just wanna, I'm gonna bring it into like a rectangle so we can divide it in half and roll each half out for our pie plate. We don't have to be perfect. That's pretty good. All right, maybe a little bit more. Okay, I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna work with one piece of dough at a time. Gather it into a nice ball. And I'm gonna roll it to about quarter inch thick, a little flour dusting so our pie does not stick. I like don't skimp on the flour when I'm rolling out a dough because the last thing you want is to work so hard on a dough just to lose it to the board. This dough is rolling out really nicely. It definitely feels more like a tart dough. I don't think this is gonna be super flaky. I think it's gonna be more on like the tender side. I have a friend who wrote a cookbook about how to make the best pumpkin pie. And she said that you should ne never use the pumpkin stuff in the can, and then the pumpkin people came after her <laughs> for uh, speaking bad about their product. You gotta be careful. The pumpkin lobbyists, they're out there. Now, I, I remember when we made the apple pie, a lot of people asked how we chilled the crust if it was ancient times, but I imagine they had like a root cellar or something like that that's a little bit colder, or maybe you just make pumpkin pie not in July. Okay, so we've got our pie plate. I've actually grown to really love these cast iron pie plates ever since the apple pie episode, and it's all I use now. I used to bake in glass. The, the crust comes out so much crunchier because cast iron retains heat really well. I've become a, a big cast iron pie plate girl. All right, we're gonna line our dough. Make sure you get into the edges. It's really easy to not get in there, and then it's gonna look a little sad when you slice it. Cool. Now I'm gonna trim off some of this edge. I wanna leave about an inch and a half off the rim so we have a little bit to crimp. These little edges, don't ever throw these out. Don't ever throw these out. My favorite thing as a kid was when my mom would make something like this, she'd roll up these scraps with cinnamon sugar, like roll it out again, and you almost have like a elephant ears. You know, those little puff pastry cookies that have like a swirl of sugar? Okay, we're all trimmed. Now we're gonna give it a little crimp. Just fold it over. Now this also makes the edge a little bit thicker, so it's gonna hold the like crimp a little bit better. And then I'm gonna go stick it in our root cellar to chill. Or outside, you know, because it's October. Nestle it among the fallen leaves. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, I'm gonna go for just a really simple crimp. This is my favorite crimp, because it's easy. We just want a little bit of height, a little, give our fill in a place to go. And then I'm gonna move on to our next pie. So even though we've got the same crust for two pies, these pies are super, super different. And I'm really excited to see how they each taste. Funny thing, the pilgrims only stopped at Plymouth because they ran out of beer. I understand that. I feel that. How can you keep going? And then they stopped and they started making pumpkin beer. So it's almost like our pumpkin pie obsession in the fall is like we're all just trying to channel our inner colonial American. Okay, all right, so now that both of my crusts are prepped, I'm gonna move on to make the filling for my French pumpkin pie from 1651. Okay, so I've got some cubed up pumpkin and we're gonna cook it in milk until it's tender. And that's gonna be mushed into a puree. And that's it, really easy filling. So I'm just gonna add enough milk to almost cover it and we're gonna let it cook really gently. I want it to get really nice and tender. While it cooks, I'm gonna get in there and like smush it up. The point is to get a really nice smooth puree. So 
In the 1600s, the Wampanoag tribe, the folks who introduced the pilgrims to the pumpkins, they were a tribe of around 40,000 people spread across 67 villages. They lived in the areas that's now Nantucket, Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and other places throughout Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But between 1615 and 1619, the tribe was completely devastated by disease, likely because they didn't have immunity to the diseases brought over by the early explorers. All right, so I think that this pie is not gonna taste a lot like the modern pumpkin pie, because there's no cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, or clove. But you know how like now pumpkin pie is all about that spice. So pumpkin pie spice didn't actually become a thing until the 1950s when McCormick decided to package it all up. You know, for folks who thought it was too hard to measure out cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg, ginger, and clove. So my pumpkin has had some time to simmer in the milk and it's really nice and tender. And the thing that's really cool is that the milk got really orangey. It's like this really bright color. I was worried about whether or not this pie would feel rich but the milk got really nice and thick from the starches in the pumpkin. It almost has like an unglazed kind of vibe. Now I'm gonna strain it through this colander and I'm gonna push through the solids because we want to be a nice smooth puree. They wouldn't have had a blender back then. So, you know, we gotta put some work into it. See how much of that pumpkin just broke down? Just in the milk? I wasn't expecting that. I thought I'd be smushing this through the colander forever. Now already, a lot of it has strained out just like on its own. And I'm just gonna use the back of the spoon to get out the big chunks and smush this out. Pumpkin pie as we know it today probably didn't come around until 1796 in Amelia Simmons's first American cookbook called American Cookery. And in there she had two recipes for something called pumpkin pie. And that's like closer to what we eat today. And now after I smush this, we're just adding some sugar, salt, and butter. And that's it, it's a really simple pie. It's gonna really be pumpkin forward. Nothing's there covering up that flavor. Colonial women must have had really good, like, strong arms. I doubt they had to go to Pilates or anything. They're just like in really good shape from all of this hard work just for making a pie. All right, so let me get this last bit of puree in here and then we're gonna mix it up and pour it into our crust. And then we're gonna bake this I don't know how set this is gonna get because there's no binder in here. So we're just fully relying on the starch from the pumpkin to hopefully hold it all together. So in here, I'm gonna add some kosher salt. You always need salt with dessert. Makes everything taste better. A Little bit of sugar. Oop. And some melted butter. That's it. Stir this up, it's going into a pie. Will it pie? I don't know. I, that's like, I feel like that's the theme of all the pies we've made. I'm just like, will it pie? I've never pied like this before. That came out really smooth, even without like a blender, I'm surprised. Because we took the time and like really slowly cooked it. Okay, going in. The color's pretty crazy. That this is all just pumpkin. They probably didn't have Pilates, but they might have had pie lotties. Huh? I thought we were done with the dad jokes, but I guess not. Ne we never end with the dad jokes. It never stops. Okay, so my French pumpkin pie is all done, and now I'm gonna move on to making my English pumpkin pie. I'm gonna break down a pumpkin. It's gonna feel very festive in here. Almost like it's time to carve a jack-o'-lantern. So I'm going to carve off the top and bottom, and we're going to cut this pumpkin into really thin slices. This is a very different recipe. I've never had a pumpkin pie like this. I've never had a pumpkin pie where the slices are, like, layered. I feel like it's always just, like, puree. Usually that's stuff in a can. You have to check out some of the pictures of the ridiculously large pumpkins. They're insane. The largest pumpkin on record was grown by Matthias Willems from Belgium. And for some context, it's bigger than a bear, than a small car, than a giraffe. The one thing it's not bigger than though is the world's largest loaf of bread. Yeah, you could head down a deep rabbit hole looking up world record breaking foods. Rabbit holes can be dangerous. Okay, so I'm gonna peel off the skin. It's really tough, so I might take a few layers to get it off. They might have done this all with a little knife, but um, 
I have to not hurt myself because we have more of these to shoot. I gotta get through this episode. So I'm gonna use a peeler, keep it safe. Nowadays, I would never try and like peel a pumpkin with a knife, it's just, um, it can get a little dicey. So for a little context, this recipe comes to us from Hannah Worley's The Queen Light Closet, which is the first ever cookbook written by a woman that we know by name. I think that the reason why most pumpkin pies nowadays are just puree is because it's so easy. You don't have to peel the pumpkin. You just split it in half and roast it. Peeling a pumpkin is kind of a pain. This peeler is really doing the job. If I was trying to do this with a paring knife, we'd be here all day. I might lose a thumb. Oh my God, did we do it? Yes, we did it, success. Okay, now I'm gonna cut this in half. It's a lot easier though, once you've peeled a pumpkin, it's a lot easier to cut it because the peel is really the toughest part. So whenever I'm cutting something big like this, I go down one side and then the other. If you try and do it all at once, you could hurt yourself, so better to be safe. Now we're gonna scoop out the guts. Now you could totally save these seeds and roast them up. Historians have found the oldest domesticated pumpkin seeds on record in the Oaxaca Highlands in Mexico that date back 7,500 years ago. It's said though that those pumpkins were much smaller and bitter. There's a lot of labor in this pumpkin pie. The carving, the scooping. Okay, my pumpkin has been cleaned out and I'm gonna start slicing it now. It's a lot of knife work here. I'm gonna go crosswise because it feels like it's gonna be the easiest thing. It's set to go very thin. And then we're gonna try and dip it in egg and fry it until it's tender. So it's gonna be pretty much cooked before it goes into the pie. One thing I've noticed with these recipes is it'll say like one apple or two apples or one pumpkin and then the amounts feel like really big and I think it's because maybe the stuff we have now is bigger. Like I did a recipe for a corn cake and when I made the corn cake, I used six cobs of corn because I used little corns from the market. But when people made it at home, they only needed two because they were using corn from the grocery store. The size of produce can like really vary. So it's a little tough when they just say one pumpkin. How much is that exactly? I don't know. Pumpkin sizes can really vary. It could be handheld. What if it's a tiny handheld pumpkin she's talking about? I actually think half is going to be plenty and I'll save this other half for another pumpkin. For another time. For another pie. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> Every step of this pie is interesting. So now we're going to dip it in an egg batter and we're going to fry it. So there is actually a recipe for a pumpkin cheesecake that predates the 1651 French one that we made earlier. And it was written by none other than Bartholomew Scappi. Buongiorno. You might remember that name because we made his gnocchi a few episodes ago. <laughs> Back to the grater it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible that that cheesecake used non-pumpkin squashes because a lot of the recipe translation weren't so clear back then. But yeah, scappy. Scappy. Grazie. So I'm whisking up my eggs, and now we're gonna add some chopped up rosemary, thyme, and sage. These are herbs that the pilgrims definitely would have had back then. So even though there's no spice, I think that the herbs are gonna bring a lot to the party. Okay, so here I'm heating up some neutral oil, uh, and we're gonna fry, dip the pumpkin in the egg and herb, and then fry it. So I'm gonna drop a little bit of egg in the oil to see if it's hot. Little drip drop. Wow. You know that the fryer is ready because the eggs are excited. Boo. Now, we go in with the pumpkin. Let's see how this does. Slice, dunk, herbs. I see good herbage. And away we go. Hey, that's stuck to it. I thought it would just like fall right off, but no, we're looking good. Good herb coverage, another slice. I feel like the oil temperature is like spot on right now. I think this pie is gonna be weird. Like this is weird. Like it's a pie filled with fried egg and fried pumpkin. Interesting, interesting, Hannah. This pie is also a lot of work. I mean, pie is usually a lot of work, but this extra step of the frying I think is like something else. 
Hopefully we get some color. It looks like we are already. So, oh yeah, beautiful brown color, which I imagine was only gonna get more caramelized in the oven. Add lots of like nice, sweet, deep flavor. This looks like I want to get like some tartar sauce to dip alongside. This doesn't look like pie filling to me right now. Okay, some of these are ready to come out. I'm just gonna keep going like one at a time. Keep an eye on it. I'm pretty impressed by how crispy and evenly coated it is with the egg. There's a lot of things that I've learned from these ancient recipes, like, like there's a lot of culinary like rules that you learn, like you must do three-step breading that like, I don't know who came up with these rules because now I'm saying like, you don't need to follow them. You can make something new, you can break the rules. My mom always had a little skillet of oil, like in the back of her stove top so she could fry on demand and I do the same thing. Like there's nothing like some casual Wednesday night French fries. Okay, so I've got my fried pumpkin slices and I'm gonna toss this together with some sugar. Gotta have sugar, it's dessert. Whoops. <laughs> and we're gonna add some currants and raisins. A lot of early pumpkin pie recipes had dried fruit added to it, like raisins, currants, and even apple. And instead of mashing or pureeing, it was very common to slice and layer the way we're doing with this pie. Now, a little bit of sherry. I love cooking with sherry. It adds like this, just like a delicate hit of that alcohol heat that I think we're not getting here because we don't have vanilla extract. So the sherry's gonna kind of hit us with that. So I'm gonna just toss this together. Oh, as soon as I added the sherry to the hot pumpkin, I can like really smell the pumpkin and those woody herbs. So this is just, this is just such an interesting pie. Woo, you know what's cool? The pumpkin is still warm. So the sugar and the sherry kind of like dissolved into a syrup, which I wasn't expecting. And it's like the pumpkin's now like absorbing it. Now, moving on to our apple. There's a lot of knife work in this one. So you really liked the people you were making this pie for. Or you're just trying to impress them. I don't know, sometimes you want to impress people you hate, right? I don't know. Is that just me? Okay, so when I was a kid and I had like a bad day at school, I would stay up all night and bake. And I don't know why my parents allowed it. Like like a 12 year old up at 3 a.m. in your kitchen unsupervised with like all of the ovens and stoves on. But they did, <laughs> they just let me do that. So yeah, I did a lot of hate baking. I think it's how I got through all of junior high and high school. All right, now we're gonna go for some thin slices. So we went for like a tart apple. Um, it's gonna give us some contrast, you know, cause the squash is sweet. We got sugar, we got currants. So a little bit of zing from our apple. Tart apples are also great because they hold together when you cook them. You know, something like a uh, golden delicious, I think is really nice for eating, but I don't really like to bake with it cause it just, unless you really want something saucy and smooth, it can be a little bit too mouchad for lack of a better term. Uh, so I have my crust, I got my apples, and I have my fried squash mixed up with all the currants. And now I'm just gonna start with a layer of apples at the bottom. I don't think I'm gonna be too precious about it. I'm just gonna cover it cause it's gonna all cook down together. So I just wanna make sure it's in one layer, but like I'm not like making beautiful concentric rings or anything cause no one's gonna see this. Now the filling's going in. There's no binder once again. like. Same thing with our French pie. No binder, no egg. So I'm wondering how this is gonna come together, but we'll see. So I don't imagine that this is gonna cook down because the pumpkin's already cooked. Maybe it'll poof a little, I don't know. Okay, now this is gonna go into the oven and then we're gonna have our side-by-side -side tasting, French versus English. All right, so while this pie is hot, I'm gonna top it with a couple pats of butter and it should just melt right in there. Add some extra richness. I usually top my pies with butter before baking. So I think this is a nice way to finish it so you get that like fresh butter taste. It's finally time to dig in. I'm really excited to see what the first Thanksgiving might have tasted like. I'm gonna start with the French pumpkin pie from 1651, the first written recipe. Okay, so the filling, I was a little worried about how it would set because there's no eggs. Nowadays, pumpkin pie 
It's a lot of eggs, a lot of cream, but it definitely set. If anything, it's like very set. I think because it was just straight up pumpkin. Let's see. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, that's a very good first slice. I've gotten really good at first slices. So the crust looks nice and crisp on the bottom. The filling looks set for sure. Maybe even a little bit starchy, but it definitely looks creamy. So I'm excited to dig in. Hmm. I am missing the spices. I am, but without the spices, the flavor of the pumpkin itself really comes through. It's pretty much just like a pumpkin puree. I'm just getting pure pumpkin puree. And without the spices or the typical like eggs and cream, I'm getting a lot of the butteriness from the crust. It's very simple, but I feel like we're highlighting the two main core ingredients really well. Oh, it reminds me of a sweet potato pie because it's a lot starchier than a modern pumpkin pie. But I think if you like sweet potato pie, you'll really like this. It's like really all about the pumpkin. Flavor really comes through and the texture is Pretty good. It's like a little bit denser than I'm used to, but it's it's tasty. I'm into it. Maybe a little dollop of whipped cream. <laughs> so this is Hannah Worley's pie from England, and this is more likely what they had, what the pilgrims had at the first Thanksgiving, because they also hailed from England, like Hannah. But like this one, the whole entire studio smells delicious. Even though there's no spice, it like really feels holiday just from the aroma of the pumpkin and the currants and the, the browning. You get a lot of like caramel smell. The top really browned very nicely. Okay. Lift, lift. Hey, not bad. Ooh, I can really smell the sage and rosemary now that I've lifted it up. Okay, it's not the cleanest slice, but not bad. Really held together very well, considering that it's just like a bunch of stuff tossed together. And you can see that apple layer at the bottom. It looks very different from the really caramelized pumpkin top. All right, so I wanna make sure I get a little pumpkin, get a little currant, a little apple. Hmm. This is interesting. I've never had a pie like this before. Hold on, I have to think about this for a second. <laughs> You know when you fry something, you taste that cooked oil taste, which gives it like a really rich savoriness. Um, and then you get the pops of currant, and then you get the apple. It's like really nicely balanced because we got kind of this savory pumpkin vibe. Even though pumpkin is sweet, the herbs kind of take it to another place. And then you have the sweet raisins and currants that kind of plumped up in that sherry. And the apples are really tender, really tender and really soft. And a lot of the sweetness is actually coming from the apple more than the fruit. It feels almost like a meal, you know? It doesn't feel like a dessert. It feels like an entree pie. I think it's really cool what I learned from these ancient recipes. They're so different, but there's also so much that I take away from it. I'm really happy to have tasted these things and get like a little bit of insight at what it might've been like, you know, back in the 1600s. So if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. And as always, if there's an ancient or vintage recipe you think would be fun or challenging for me to try out, Drop it in the comments below, and I'm gonna get back to all of my pumpkin pie and spice. I'll see you next time.